Ladies and gentlemen, please welcome Peter Bradbury, SVP of Strategic Account Management at Nielsen. Well, good afternoon and welcome back. What a terrific morning we've had. So I'm Peter Bradbury and I am Nielsen's ambassador to the Advertising Research Foundation. And it's my distinct pleasure to be here today to introduce our next uh, presentation. This past fall, CBS introduced the Campaign Performance Audit. The CPA uh, has been designed as a multi-stage program for measuring the effectiveness of television advertising. The CPA utilizes a full complement of Nielsen's analytics to plan, execute, and evaluate each television campaign from the initial creation of the creative all the way through to the, calcu uh, the calculation of the ROI. Here to share insights from this work and to challenge the conventional thinking that television is on the decline and that the value de creation is diminishing, <clears throat> and to start a dialogue about the value and the unique ability of television to drive profitable short-term sales as well as build long-term equity, are David Poltrak, the Chief Research Officer of CBS and President of CBS Vision, as well as the Chairman of the ARF, and Leslie Wood, the Chief Research Officer of Nielsen Catalina Solutions. So please join me in welcoming David and Leslie to the ARF stage. Good afternoon. Uh, before we begin today, I must acknowledge St. Patrick's Day. After all, I am one half Irish and a proud member of the Notre Dame Fighting Irish family, or, as I, or should I say, the ACC champion Fighting Irish family. Now down to business. What I will be doing today is introducing you to our new CPA analytical framework for measuring the ROI of advertising campaigns. We have chosen the CPA acronym as a homage to our colleagues from the finance and procurement side. Let's start with a little historical perspective. Due to my age, I am the go-to guy on a historical perspective. <laughs> Over time, research has confirmed the following. TV advertising works. Broadcast primetime is the most effective medium to build reach, Effective weekly reach is correlated to ROI. The recency concept states that the goal should be to have the schedule that provides the greatest probability that the last ad in the category seen by the consumer before the purchase will be your ad. And finally, program engagement correlates with higher advertising recall. Since the turn of the century, many advertisers have changed their media strategies, resulting in two recent trends. We have seen the leaning of the TV mix. Cable non-prime time, uh, non-prime now dominates in terms of number of spots. Broadcast prime role has now been challenged, and it seems to all be all about CPM efficiencies. We've also seen the shifting of dollars from TV to digital. The question is, why? Why are advertisers taking these actions? If television advertising works and broadcast primetime television works best, why are some advertisers moving money away from these alternatives? Could it be that these alternatives do not, that these advertisers do not know what effective television, how effective television is in generating sales? Could could they not know the superior aspect of broadcast prime time as a television advertising medium? In 2014, broadcast prime time accounted for only 27% of national television network ad dollars. And the shift of spending is no longer going to cable prime, it's going to low rated, low CPM, non prime offerings. For broadcast prime time, that compares to 42% at the start of the decade. 
Why are advertisers undermining their investments in television, the preeminent reach medium, by moving away from the product of that medium that delivers the reach, broadcast prime time? This is in spite of the fact that AdWorks 2, the most definitive study measuring the effectiveness of television advertising, and including campaigns for over 200 brands, demonstrated that the television campaigns that delivered the greatest ROI were those that contained a mix of broadcast prime, broadcast non-prime, and cable. The ideal campaign was found to be one in which about one quarter of the GRPs came from prime time, which would translate to about one half of the dollars going, coming from prime time. More recent ROI projects have confirmed the superiority of dispersed schedules containing high-rated broadcast and original cable prime time in delivering ROI. For example, in a recent study done by Simul Media for a successful travel company campaign, 85% of the recorded transactions accounted for by those exposed to the TV ads came from those exposed to the ads in prime time. Prime time only represented about two-thirds of the actual exposures. Fortunately, as this example demonstrates, new research and big data resources now allow advertisers to directly measure the ROI from their television advertising campaigns, not only in aggregate, but by component day parts and even by program in some cases. It is time for advertisers to move from demographic efficiency to performance-based measures as the basis for ca advertising campaign evaluation. This is pr pr precisely what we hope to help them accomplish with the introduction of our new campaign performance audit analytical program. We have built this program in partnership with Nielsen around measurement in, the fi in five critical areas of a television advertising campaign. The five elements of the CPA are as follows. Each of these five steps in the CPA project, product, uh, process can be seen as addressing a specific question regarding the campaign. Step one, test your message. Start with research confirming that you have effective ads that communicate a compelling message. Exposure to advertising on television is only going to yield results if the ad is effective and the message resonates with the audience. And in most cases, the ad has to not only be effective, it has to also be more effective than the competitive ads, if it is expected to generate incremental sales. Step number two, maximize your weekly reach. Determine if your campaign maximizes reach among your target market on a weekly basis during the campaign period, not just on a full campaign basis. We have noted that many advertisers who are leaning their television mix, buying less and less prime time, argue that doing so only minimally reduces the overall reach of their campaign. But for a six or 12 week campaign for a product in which consumer transactions are taking place every week, is overall reach the, a relevant measure? Shouldn't the proximity of the exposure to the purchase occasion be taken into consideration. Step three, get the most out of recency. A, comp a comprehensive competitive schedule analysis will tell you how you did against the goal of reaching the greatest number of category buyers as close to the purchase occasion as possible and after the last exposure to your competitor's message. Erwin Efron's concept of recency has stood the test of time. As I will soon demonstrate, achieving this goal is unlikely to be the case when, with a schedule lacking in high-rated programs. Step four, precisely target potential customers. Ensure that your campaign reaches the right audience. Today, that, that audience can be defined in precise purchaser profiles, as opposed to broad-based, increasingly irrelevant age, gender, demographic trends. 
CBS has purchased single source product usage user profiles from a range of suppliers. That includes the comprehensive Nielsen Catalina Solutions and Nielsen Buyer Insight databases. We can not only tell advertisers how, they, how many of our viewers are purchasers of their, in their categories, we can tell them how many of them buy their brand and, what, and the volume of their purchases. There is no need to rely on age, gender, surrogates. Step five, consider context. Since ad performance is affected by context, determine how many of your ads are aired in the top programs with highly engaged audiences, exposed to a limited number of high quality advertising messages. Did those premium exposures deliver extraordinary results? That is the framework of the campaign performance audit. Now let's see it in action. There's a growing array of excellent research tools for the measurement of the effectiveness of an ad in capturing the attention of the consumer, conveying the right message to that consumer, and motivating that consumer to take the desired action. These include all of the exciting new neuro and biofeedback tools. One very intensely competitive advertising category is the auto category. With the large number of competitors and the resulting high volume of advertising messages, it is a challenge to each advertiser to break through. One automaker that has done so recently is Buick. One of the most comprehensive measures of television advertising effectiveness is Nielsen's Brand Effects Service, which regularly captures the general recall, brand recall, message recall, and likability of ads running in prime time on the four broadcast networks and the major cable networks. This chart shows the results for the Buick, uh, Buick campaign that was running this fall. You can see that this extraordinary campaign clearly exceeded the auto category norms in all four measures. Particularly impressive was the message recall score, which was three times the norm. A sure sign of an effective ad is the increase in the amount of word of mouth discussion about that brand. Checking with, in with Keller Fay's word of mouth tracking, the most comprehensive measure of the total socialization results for a brand, we find a huge gain in the reported word of mouth impressions for Buick driven by TV. The message appears to have been particularly effective with the younger adult 18 to 54 segment with whom total word of mouth activity grew 48%. But most important of all, Buick sales grew 11.4% in 2014, almost double the gain for the overall auto market. Once you've established that your television ads effectively communicate your message, then you have to address the task of getting that message to as many people as possible. As I've already mentioned, many advertisers that have leaned their day part mix for efficiency purposes argue that the limited reduction in campaign reach is not significant. But is it enough to reach someone once or twice over a 12-week campaign? For frequently purchased products, the consumer is likely to be making a purchase in the category each week. Even for products or service categories with much longer purchase cycles, the actual purchase transactions are fairly evenly split over a number of weeks. This campaign may attain maximum reach over its 12-week run, but it is reaching less than half the target market each week. In order to achieve the desired recency concept goal of having your ad be the last one seen by as many of that week's shoppers in the category as possible, the planner has to address not just the overall reach results, but the weekly effective reach as well. Generally, the effective reach target is between three and 10. One or two exposures may not be enough, and more than 10 exposures may have marginal return. The goal would be to readjust the mix to convert the excessive exposure of one consumer with a third exposure for 
another computer, consumer. Step four addresses the target purchaser. Unfortunately, most of the tools used today to build reach and effective frequency schedules use surrogate age, gender targets instead of actual purchasers. Optimizers are not of much value if they're optimizing against the wrong audience. You have already heard enough from me on this subject. Let me provide one illustration to show that demographic targeting is not enough. This example is from the retail sector. Here are the top 20 non-sports primetime programs for the fall with the heavy shoppers for one retailer according to Nielsen's, Nielsen's Buyer Insights tally. Now we're going to show the top 20 with the heavy shoppers with one of the retailer's key rivals. Note that the programs have shifted in the rankings. Let's look at another rival. Again, quite a difference in the rankings. We've highlighted, the four, we've highlighted four top shows to show how they move up and down in the rankings as we shift from one set of store customers to another. In fact, the average top 20 program ranking shifts six places when you combine the program ranking with each retailer's customers to the rankings with the customers of the other two retailers. The average variation between the composite customer rankings and the 18 to 49 demographic ranking of these programs is even more substantial, 11, 11 places. The, the fifth step in the CPA is consider context. Over the years, there's been a great deal of research documenting that a program context in which an ad appears will affect the performance of that ad. Despite what the efficiency champions tell you, the program context does in fact affect the viewer's reaction to the ad. A compilation of, of the results of two years of ad measurement by Nielsen Brand Effects for ads running between June of 2010 and May of 2012 found an 81% correlation between their program engagement, the program engagement of the program, and the general ad recall score within those programs. A just released Nielsen study using traditional and new neurological methods to measure engagement found that neurological engagement correlated with Twitter activity, a social activity. Combining these findings with previous research linking the same neurological engagement measures with sales outcome, and Nielsen's brand effects research showing that ads and television programs with high engagement are more memorable, Nielsen concluded that advertising in highly social programs could be an opportunity to drive both ad memorabilia, uh, memorability and sales outcome. Nielsen's brand effect results show ad results to be stronger in primetime broadcast programs than in cable primetime programs. Now, while some of this may be due to the lower number of ads in primetime programs, some of the variation may be explained by the difference in ad scores between original and repeat primetime programs. Here are the brand effect ad scores for ads running in The Walking Dead. You can see the results are significantly higher for the original episodes and lower for the repeat telecast. And of course, there are far more repeat telecasts of this program than originals, 448 to 16 to be exact. This gives the broadcast networks a clear advantage with advertisers since they run far more original programming than their cable competition. Clearly, the same ads are likely to perform differently in different program environments. Looking back at that successful Buick campaign that drew so much positive word of mouth, we see from the Keller Fay result that the word of mouth reaction was particularly strong among Criminal Minds viewers. When selecting a schedule for an ad campaign, these contextual differences must be considered. This is especially true now that multitasking has enhanced the advertising environment by allowing connected viewers to react immediately to the ad messages. 
To illustrate the misguided nature of the leaning of the, of the mix of television campaigns, I will offer two case histories. The first of these case histories deals with two food brands that are top competitors in a large crowded segment of that category. The misguided movement out of broadcast prime into allegedly more efficient day parts has been concentrated among major CPG brands. In our example, brand A is a brand that virtually eliminated primetime programming in their fall 2014 campaign. The competitive, the, the competitive brand, brand B, moved in the same direction. Let's apply some of our CPA metrics to their campaigns and then look at the results of these changes in television campaign strategy. First, let's confirm that the ads themselves were effective. For brand A, the results were above the category norm in about three of four of the four metrics. For brand B, the results were above the category norm in two of the four metrics. So two solid advertising campaigns. Let's look at the fourth quarter of 2013 when both brands had some broadcast prime on their schedules. Both brands spent about the same amount of money in 2013. Moving to, two, to steps two and three, let's look at the reach and frequency dynamics of both campaigns. Please note that these are not exact spending levels. They're the estimates combined by Matt by looking at the actual CBS spending and modeling uh, the remainder of the schedule against the new SMI spending reports. Overall, Brand B achieved the higher weekly reach among category buyers. However, Category A confined their prime time, the broadcast prime time to the heavier level first six weeks of the campaign. During that six weeks, they pretty much matched the reach level of brand B. If we focus on the first six weeks, we see that those exposed to the primetime ads spent more than, than those just exposed to the non-prime ads. Brand A did not have enough broad actual broadcast primetime to treat it out separately, so we had to combine it with cable prime. If we now switch to the last six weeks of the campaign in which there was no broadcast prime time, we see a smaller difference between the return from those exposed to the non-prime ads and those exposed to the cable prime and the non-prime ads together. Now let's move to the fourth quarter of 2014. We see that both brands have now abandoned broadcast prime and both brands have also seen significant drops in their weekly reach. Let's look a little deeper at the comparative reach of the two campaigns. Together, the two brands only reached about half the category buyers each week. Almost three quarters of those buyers saw ads from both brands. Brand A had more buyers exposed to their ads exclusively, 15% to 11% for brand B. Let's look at how each brand did with the buyers that saw both ads and the buyers that just saw their ads. For brand A, we see that those exposed to their ads exclusively accounted for 7% more revenue than those that were not exposed to their ads. And the difference between those, the unexposed, and those exposed to the ads of both participants was 6.4% for brand A, slightly less than the lift for those exposed exclusively. So, the good news is that exposure to the ads increases buyer activity, and exclusive exposure to the ads increases that activity even more. Not surprising, but comforting. Now let's look at the results for brand B. Here the lift for, the, for those exposed to brand B's ads exclusively versus those not exposed to their ads at all is a more impressive 12.2%. Brand B also does better with those exposed to both ads, to both ads, eight plus 8.9%. So, do you see the problem here? 
you have two major competing brands with effective advertising generating incremental sales. Unfortunately, they're moving in a parallel manner that is reducing the number of potential buyers they reach with that advertising every week. What if one of them had not cut the broadcast prime time, which was working so effectively for them? Let's look at brand A. We added three spots a week in broadcast prime time to their schedule. The weekly reach went up from 48.5 to 54.6, a 13% increase. Not only does this increase the weekly reach, it increases the overall campaign reach, and it accelerates the reach buildup trajectory. It also increases the all-important effective reach level from 20% to 22.4%. Bottom line, either of these brands could have gained a significant competitive advantage by adding pro broadcast prime time to their schedule. Broadcast prime time that had delivered a positive ROI for them in the past. The real bottom line is that both brands lost market share and sales were declined and had sales declines into th in the fourth quarter of 2014. Our second case history is for a brand nor pesticides that did not go with the pack. This brand moved into broadcast prime time in 2014. Let's look at its performance along the CPA dimensions. First, this brand had a very effective ad in all of the brand effects measures, particularly the key message recall measure. The addition of primetime allowed NOR to increase the weekly reach of its campaign significantly over last fall's level. On an overall basis, the campaign delivered with those exposed to the campaign accounting for 5% more dollars in spending versus those unexposed. And their investment in broadcast prime really paid off, producing more than double the return on ad spend of the lower rated spots. Nor pesticides gained market share in the fourth quarter. I guess that says it all. Television advertising works, but it only works when people are exposed to that advertising. If CPG advertisers continue to reduce their spending and cut out broadcast prime from their schedules, they are going to leave more and more potential buyers unexplode, unexposed to their advertising, and they're going to leave money on the table every week. We would like to congratulate Noor on their David Ogilvie Award. Just a quick observation con concerning the movement of dollars from di television to digital. We believe in digital advertising. We're a major player in the game. What we do not understand is why an advertiser would take dollars from one of the most effective elements of the mar overall marketing effort to fund their digital experimentation. SMI is a new service reporting actual t advertising spending on a granular level across all media. For this broadcast year to date, digital spending is up 30%. If we it would appear that cable is being affected more by this uh, movement to digital than broadcast. But there is no question that digital is having an overall impact. We know for one thing that the two brands that we studied, brands A and B, both increased, both had significant digital expenditures in the fall of 2014, and it did not work. There are two possible scenarios here. In the first scenario, the advertiser's television campaign is working. The ROI is positive. If an advertiser takes money from this campaign to fund a digital effort, even if the digital effort also produces a positive ROI, the net gain will be the digital gain minus the loss resulting from the reduction of an effective television campaign. Why not fund the digital efforts with money from a less productive element of the marketing program or from new investment funds. 
The other scenario is one where the television is not working. In all probability, this is because the ads themselves and or the messaging is not effective. In that case, transferring the creative elements of the campaign to the digital platform is not likely to be effective either. Fortunately for CBS, we have a successful and growing digital program that perfectly complements our television properties. If an advertiser is moving to digital to expand the reach of the ad an advertising campaign, and most of them tell us that's what they're doing, we would recommend that they consider advertising on the same program on our digital platform as they do on our television platform. After all, we know that those one million plus younger adults watching this week's episode of Big Bang Theory on our website are not the same viewers that watched that episode on the network that week. Now, that's what I call a true reach solution. One that I'm happy to report many advertisers have already discovered. And for those of you that are justifiably concerned about the quality of some of the digital offerings, we have good news for you on that front as well. Nielsen Brand Effects has, is now measuring our streaming, stream content as well as our broadcast content. Here are the summary findings for those respondents exposed to the broadcast and the stream versions of our programming alone and together. Note how the streaming metrics are very close to our strong on-air numbers and that they jump substantially when we combine the, those exposed to the television with those exposed to the digital. The pattern is the same across all categories, from auto to retail to CBG. These data make a strong case for the cross-media buy on CBS. We're currently in discussion with Nielsen about extending our campaign performance audit across these platforms. Our early work with the CPA has clearly demonstrated the power of our television product as a positive ROI-generating medium for uh, marketers. Thank you for your time. Your feedback is important. We look forward to hearing from those of you interested in this new approach.